Amen. Amen. If you got a Bible, take it and turn with me to Luke chapter 14 today. That's where we're going to be uh, parked out for a few minutes. And focusing on the gospel of Luke, making Jesus known. The gospel of Luke, making Jesus known. That was Luke's heartbeat. His heart cry to God was that he might be able to make Jesus known to this world. So that's the reason, one of the reasons he wrote this book that we call the gospel of Luke. And today as we get into Luke chapter 14, we're looking at what I've entitled the invitation. The invitation. Now when you look at this text and when we walk through it in just a moment, you're going to notice that 13 times he uses the word invite or invitation. Jesus is using this word over and over again. And it simply means to call, to call someone, perhaps even to call them by name and say, hey, Sally, hey, Jim, hey, hey, John, would you, would you come? I want you to come and join me in this experience. And so think about that as I read this text from Luke chapter 14 and verse 1. It happened that when he went, Jesus, went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guest when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 12. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When the one who had, were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to them, Blessed is he who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, Jesus said to him, a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he said to his slave, to send his slave to sow to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But when they all alike began to make excuses, the first one said to him, I bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. The invitation. You probably received some interesting invitations in your life, some of them casual, some of them formal. You know, some of them may be by text or a phone call or just a chance meeting with someone in the hallway. Or it might have been one of those formal invitations that's really 
nice and expensive and wrapped in foil and all those kinds of things with an RSVP for you to respond and uh, hoping you'll come, but they want, they want to know if you're going to. Several years ago, I received an invitation from an organization that invited me to go on a mission trip. Well, I'd never been on a mission trip before. I'd wanted to go, but it just didn't seem the appropriate time or the right opportunity. And so I started to take that letter and toss it in the garbage can, like a lot of you do sometimes when you get solicited for one thing or another. But as I began to get uh, pray about it, I, I was impressed by the Lord. Maybe I should respond to that invitation. And so I decided that I would. And uh, I got on a plane with uh, this, an associate pastor in the church, and we flew to the island of Indonesia. And you talk about a rude awakening from a, for a country boy from Mississippi. I mean, I, it was a whole new world for me to go to a place like that. I, I knew it was different when I stepped off the plane and I felt the humidity. You think it gets hot in Alabama? You ought to go to Indonesia. It's 98 degrees every day and it's 120% humidity over there. You get wet just standing on the street corner sweating. It's, it's a whole new world. But God moved in my heart in that experience and I just knew that I needed to be a part of that. And so I came back and shared that with Forest Lake Baptist Church. And through those years, we've built a partnership with people who serve over there. We wound up sending seven teams to visit that country and work with those uh, missionaries over the years. And those missionaries have been with us as well on many occasions. So I share that with you just to say, you never know what can come of an invitation. Don't dismiss an invitation sometimes because God can work in your life in mighty ways through a simple invitation. Jesus is invited to have a meal at a man's house, a Pharisee's house. And he uses that opportunity as a teaching moment to teach us some things about being invited into eternal life through faith in him as the Messiah. So let me just give you a simple three-point outline today. Jesus, first of all, talks about an invitation to humanity. He talks about an invitation to humanity. He invites us to identify with the people that are around us and the needs that they have. This party, the Bible tells us, was held at a man's house who was a Pharisee. And anytime you would invite an itinerant rabbi into your house for a meal, it was supposed to be to honor that person because they were respected by others. But this wasn't the occasion or the intent of the occasion of this particular party. He didn't want to honor Jesus. He wanted to hurt Jesus. He wanted to catch Jesus in some slip of the tongue, something that he would say that he could then use against him to undermine his ministry. And so Jesus is sitting at the table and they're all sitting around the table eating with him and they're just watching him. They've got eyes on him. They're listening to everything that he might say. And not only that, he invites his colleagues, the Pharisee does, all of his uh, buddies in the, in, in the work, we might say, who did the same kind of thing that he did, who, who taught the law and, and uh, looked down on others who didn't practice the law the way that they did. And they're watching Jesus trying to catch him in something. And the scripture says there in verse 2, there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. You say, well, what in the world is dropsy? Well, dropsy is just simple fluid retention. You ever, you ever have any fluid retention? <laughs> oh, of course, I bet you do. Uh, you may not know what to call it sometimes, but you have fluid retention. Sometimes I get fluid retention. I wear that mask. It makes little lines on my face. You have any problem like that? It might be fluid retention. I don't know. But if you have a really bad problem with fluid retention, it can shut your organs down. So here's a man that didn't have just a mild illness. He had a major dysfunction going on in his body. And he comes to Jesus because he needs help. He's not there by accident that day. He comes because he needs help. And so the scripture says that Jesus asked the Pharisees a question. It, I just love how Jesus turns the table on people. They, they're there to trap him. They're there to undermine him. And Jesus is not threatened by that. He just turns the table on them. And he asks this question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Jesus is asking, what is the proper response in the situation that we're in? A lot of us are wondering that today with the election process that we've just moved through. Can I get a witness? Can anybody say amen? We're trying to figure out what the proper response for a believer is in the day in which we live. Now, the legal experts were already debating what to do with a guy like this on the Sabbath. 
And their rule was that if you practice medicine, that you could not heal on the Sabbath, or if you did, you would be working at your profession, and therefore you would break God's law. Okay? That's what they said, and that's what they taught. And so Jesus asked them the question, is it against the law, the law of God, not the law of the land, is it against the law of God for this man to be healed on the Sabbath? And they had no response to him whatsoever. They didn't answer the question because they knew what the answer was, but they didn't want to give it to Jesus. And so the scripture says that Jesus just reached out and healed the man miraculously and then sent him on his way. And in verse 5, he asked another question. Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? So what is the real question that Jesus is asking them? Here's the question Jesus is asking. Where is your humanity? Where is your humanity? You're not even acting like a human being. You've got somebody in front of you that is suffering, and you don't care about them. All you care about is your law and your rules and making sure that everybody abides by the law like you think they should. He's asking them, where is your heart? Don't you even care this man is hurting and you're not concerned about him at all? And so we ask a question. If on the Sabbath day you have a child that would fall into uh, an open pit of some kind, the, the, I mean, Palestine it was notorious at this time for having pits that had no kind of border on them, a well that had no kind of border to, to guard a person. They didn't have OSHA back then, okay? Uh, they just didn't have all those rules and regulations. And so a child could easily slip into a pit. He said, which one of you would have a child that would fall into a pit or a well on the Sabbath day and not immediately rescue that child? Or even if you had an ox, let's say not a child, maybe it's just an animal, one of your Pets are not even that much. Maybe just an animal you use to plow the field with. And one of those animals slips into that pit. Would you not rescue them on the Sabbath? And of course, they, they knew the answer. The answer was yes, because a lot of them had done that already. Okay, you get it? A lot of them had already done that kind of thing, but they wouldn't admit it to Jesus because they wouldn't want to join in with his point of view. I read about a, an American ocean liner that was swept, swept out into uh, a storm. And uh, one of the staff was on, on the deck and the ship lunged to one direction and that person was tossed out into the water. Now, I've been on several cruises in my life and that's one of my fears. You get up on deck, a big wind's going to come along, it's going to toss you out in the ocean, you know. So that's what happened to this person. And immediately when someone saw it, they said, man overboard, man overboard. So they threw a life preserver out, and it's dark. And it's kind of hard to tell if they, were, if they got him or not. And finally, uh, they asked the question, do you have the line? And a voice came back out of the dark water and said, no, but the line has me. He had slipped that life preserver over his neck, and he, he was, it was holding on to him more than he was holding on to it. Folks, we have people in our culture that are struggling every day, and they need a line cast out to them, a line of love, a line of hope, a line of grace, a line of mercy. Jesus is asking, where is your humanity? How can you walk by this person that is hurting like this so much and not only care nothing for them, but be intent on undermining me and my ministry? Then verse 6, here's, here's what it simply said, they could make no reply. The truth is they were unwilling to reply to Jesus because they knew they were wrong. So Jesus, first of all, the truth is he invites us to humanity. He invites us to at least act human. Can I get a witness? Amen. At least act human in the world in which we live. And I fear as I watch our culture, we're getting less and less human. We're getting anesthetized to the hurt that is around us. And it should be so easy for those of us who are Christians to sense and then act in order to help others. So the first invitation is an invitation to humanity. Number two, there's an invitation to humility. Jesus invites us to take on his attitude in serving other people. 
Look at what it says in verse 7. He noticed how they had been picking out places of honor at the table. Now, when a rabbi would come to a place like this, they'd give a party in his honor, they would invite him to come, and then others would be invited to come as well. And when the guests began to file into the room, they began to maneuver for the best seats at the table, all right? And what the truth was, the person who sat closest to the teacher or the rabbi supposedly had the best seat or the most important. They were the most important in culture. Now, we know in a Baptist church where the best seats are, right? For those of you that are online with us, you just need to come and see. The best seats are always where? In the very back of the auditorium. The very back of the auditorium, okay? And who sits on the front rows? Well, nobody sits on the front row except Alicia and me because it's the people that are on program, right? They've got something to do up on the platform or on the stage as we call it. And so you just don't get on the front row unless you're going to sing or you're going to preach or something like that, or unless you don't know anything about church and you just kind of wander up there and sit down or, or there's no place left. We don't have that problem much in our churches these days where there's no seat left in the house and you get down on the front row. So where is the best place in this, in this party that Jesus is going to? Well, it's right next to Jesus. And so people began to jockey. Can you imagine the scene? I, Jesus has a great sense of humor. Because when he describes this as grown people are scuffling, trying to get the best seat. They're elbowing each other out. Says, hey, that's my seat. Don't get in that seat. Well, the host is given the party. And so the host makes the seat arrangements. Are you with me? The host decides where everybody's going to sit. It's like at a wedding reception. You go to a, a, a dinner or something like that. They've got the little placard up there, Donnie Payne. This is where you're supposed to sit. You ever get tempted to move that and sit somewhere else? You know, just, just out of meanness, you know, sit somewhere else. Well, that's where you're supposed to sit. So the host makes the seating arrangements, and then the host kind of comes in last in this type of gathering. And so the host walks into the room, and he looks around, and he notices that some people are sitting in the wrong seats. Uh-oh, you're in the wrong place. And so he's going to call you out by name, and he's going to say, Hey, Johnny, get out of that place and go back over there and sit. And Susie, by the way, you, that's your seat. You come on up here and sit. And so Jesus just uses this story to humble people. He says in verse 8, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. Don't take those best seats, Jesus says, because there's always the possibility you're going to be called out by the host and embarrassed in front of everyone else. Wouldn't it be better if you were honored by the host in front of everyone else, wouldn't it be better if you took a back seat, so to speak, and then let the host come in and say, hey, it's so good to see you. I'm glad you came. Listen, I've reserved this special place for you right down here by me. Come on down here. And then you would be honored by the host. That's what he says in, in verse 9. He who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you will proceed to occupy the, the last place. It's better to be a person of humility. Listen to me. It's better to be a person of humility than to be humiliated by the Lord Jesus. Amen. It's better to choose humility first than for the Lord to force you into a place of humility that you didn't volunteer for. Peter Marshall uh, said this, Lord, where we are wrong, make us willing to change. And where we are right, make us easy to live with. <laughs> Sometimes I'm right, but I'm not easy to live with. I like that prayer. Lord, humble me. Help me to have a humble heart, a humble attitude when I deal with others. Because I don't want to have to be humbled by you. So what is Jesus teaching us here? He's teaching us that we don't need to try to raise our social status by being with certain people or wearing certain clothes or living in certain neighborhoods or, or driving certain cars. You know, what we should be out is not to impress others, but to impress Jesus, to impress the Lord. And the Lord is not impressed with all those outward things. He's impressed with what's in the heart. Amen. He's impressed with what's in our heart and whether our heart is right with him. And then he just gives this blanket principle for life in verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said this another way in, in Luke chapter 13, verse 29. 
And they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first. And some are first who will be last. I'm telling you, my heart's beat. My heart beats with a, a, a sense of humility. Someone said, humility is a strange thing. Just the time you think you have it, you don't. You know, and I've heard other people say, yeah, humility is my best attribute. Of course, if it is, you, you would never say anything like that. You, you, you want to have a humble heart. You pray for a humble heart. I ran across a prayer. It's called an old man's prayer. And uh, just indulge me for just a moment. He says, Lord, you know, I'm growing older. Keep me from the idea that I must express myself on every subject. Release me from the craving to meddle in everyone's affairs. Keep my tongue from the recital of endless details of the past which do not interest others. Seal my lips when I'm inclined to talk about my aches and pains. They are increasing with the years and my love to speak of them grows sweeter as time goes by. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally I may be wrong. Make me thoughtful, not interfering, helpful, but not bossy. With the wisdom and experience I've gained, it does seem a pity not to use it all. But you know, Lord, I want to have a few friends at the end. <laughs> I like that. God, help us to have a humble heart. Give us a good dose of humility. Because without humility, we'll never have humanity. And being able to recognize those who need the help around us. So here's the last invitation. is the invitation to honesty. And this may be the best of them all. Jesus invites us to connect with him as our source of life. Jesus invites us to honestly connect with him as our source of life. So in this setting, there's a guy at the table that says something inappropriately. You're not that person at the party, are you, that always opens your mouth and inserts your foot well, that's what this guy does. He simply says in verse 15, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That sounds, sounds like I want to say amen to that. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus knew that this guy is just making a pious remark so that he might impress other people. And so this is how Jesus responds to this man's statement. Verse 16. He said, but he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And he goes on to tell this story about how a, uh, a king or a master or a lord of an area, whatever, gives this fabulous feast and invites a lot of people to come. Well, when they had these kind of affairs back then, they would always send out two invitations. The first invitation was kind of the formal invitation that had the RSVP on it. You, you, you need to respond to this because we're cooking for you, and if you don't come, it's going to be expensive for us. Okay, that's what that basically means. That's what RSVP means, okay? They're cooking for you, and you need to tell them if you're not going to come so they don't have too many steaks left over, all right? So the first invitation is a formal invitation. And everybody who got the formal invitation, the first invitation, would have responded by now. Enough time had lapsed, and everybody had enough time to mail, mail it back or whatever they did back then, send a courier to say, I'm coming or I can't make it. Everybody would have had time to respond by then to this first invitation. The second invitation would have been to say to you who had already agreed to come, supper's ready, come and get it, Okay. Everything's ready. It's on the table. You need to get here, and it'll be ready to be served by the time you arrived. So for a person who agreed to the first invitation, but then later refused the second invitation, it would have been the highest insult. History tells us that this is even the occasion of some wars in the past because someone said, yes, I'll come, and then to turn away at the last moment is a supreme insult. So all who had, in, all had been invited and said, yes, they would come, Jesus then makes them the focal point of the story. And he begins to list the excuses that they gave for not coming at the last minute. Some of these are hilarious. Look at what it says, verse 18. I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. 
Now listen, everybody, lean into me, okay? Don't buy a piece of land unless you go check it out first, okay? I mean, that's a very simple, you got that? Don't buy something like that unless you go check it out first. Uh, if, if you're not willing to do that, I've got some oceanfront property in Oklahoma I'd love to sell you today, okay? So it's a ridiculous excuse. Verse 19, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Here is a wealthy person who has the means to buy 10 ox, okay? 10 oxen, five sets of them. And he says, I need to go try these out. That would be like you ordering a Ferrari and just knowing it's going to fit everything about you. You order it online, you have them draft your bank account, uh, a million bucks, ever how much those things cost, I don't know. It, you're, it's obvious that I'm out of place in making this point, okay? But you buy something extremely expensive like that and you say, well, I've got to go check it out because I've bought it. You would never do that. You'd, I hope you wouldn't spend that kind of money without checking it out, making sure you're making good investment. So this person obviously would have had the means to also have servants who would have checked out the animals to see whether or not they could pull a plow before he bought them on that day. So the excuse is not valid. Verse 20, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. You men, don't you laugh right now. <laughs> if you might be in trouble when you get back home, okay? I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. The truth is, grooms were excused from military service for 12 months after they married and for, from some other occasions so that they might focus attention on their wife and develop their relationship so their marriage would last a lifetime. There's something to be said for that. So you don't get drafted in the military for 12 months. That's true. But it wasn't true for this type of affair. It was not a valid excuse for skipping the feast, especially when he had said he had already would come. The truth is, they weren't being honest with Jesus. They weren't being honest with their hosts about the meal. So the host says, verse 21, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Why does Jesus tell the story this way? Because the poor would have no other invitations to dinner. Nobody's going to invite these people to dinner. You're going to invite, as Jesus told them, most people are going to invite their, their friends, their family members. They're not going to invite these people. So the poor would have no other invitation. The blind could not see how to go to the farm and check it out. The crippled could not be able to walk behind an oxen and a plow to see if they would test well. The lame would be unlikely to marry because they couldn't earn a living and take care of their family. So Jesus uses all of these people that are ostracized by society, and he says these are the ones that should be invited and in this party. So I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, who am I in the story? Who are you? in the story. Are you one of those that got the invitation and said you'd come, but you never did? Are you one of those that maybe you've never had the invitation because you felt like you, you didn't qualify for it? You, you felt like you were one of those blind, lame, crippled people. You're one of those, but now the invitation is being extended to you. Are you one of those people? I tell you who I am in the story. I'm the slave. I'm the slave who goes out at the bidding of the master and says, invite them to come in. Just go out in the hedges and the highways and give the invitation. Give the, the invitation that I have prepared everything that's necessary if they'll just come. Just come. And we can take on that role as well as his children. Whatever our role is, we need to understand that we need to be honest with Jesus. Honest with Jesus. Okay, Lord, here I am. I'm not pretending anything. I know that the word says that you love me and you've prepared a feast for me. And the word says, you have invited me to come into a personal relationship with you. So are you going to be honest with him or not? You know, you can be like some of these people, just make excuses. Now I'll tell you something, the excuses that we offer God are going to sound just as ridiculous at the last day as these excuses seem in this story right now.
They're going to say, oh, Jesus, but I was busy making a living. I was busy trying to get my degree. I was busy raising children. I was busy chasing after a career. Oh, I was busy trying to get ready for retirement. I was busy trying to avoid the hospital and COVID. I, I was just, I, I, had, I had things to do, Jesus, that I couldn't walk after you and follow after you. I heard your call when you simply said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But I just, I just didn't get around to it, Jesus. John chapter 1 and verse 12, the scripture says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So there's the invitation. <laughs> the invitation is, is Jesus extending his arms. Someone said, if you ever doubt that, you love you, that, that you're loved or, or of any value, just look at the cross. Christ extends his arms and says, I love you this much. I love you this much. Now, won't you come and have a personal relationship with me? So there's the invitation. You just have to be honest about what you're going to do about it. And you can't have it two ways. You can't, you can't really say, okay, I'm just going to wait and I'll do this later. I'll do it later when I get some bills paid off or I get these kids raised or I get, I get that promotion at work. I'll do it later, Jesus. No, when, when you say wait, you're saying no to Jesus. And you don't know. Honestly, you do not know if you'll have another chance to say yes. Because the invitation's not always there. You know, when the invitation comes to you, not just when you see what's written in God's Word or, or hear it preached in a sermon like this or, or sung in, in the great songs that we sang a few moments ago. The invitation comes to you when the Holy Spirit of God takes those truths and connects them to your heart and what's going on in your life. And the Spirit draws you to Jesus. The Spirit says, listen, come. Come on. This is the right time. You, you need to come to Jesus today. And in those moments, you need to say yes. Those are golden moments. Golden moments in your life. You need to say yes to Jesus. And no excuse that you offer will ever be valid when Christ has loved you that much and done that much for you. Won't you accept his invitation today? Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for letting us come and worship you today. And we read what Jesus says in this story of the host who extended an invitation and yet so many refuse to say yes. He actually says that none of those who were invited to my feast will be able to come in. God, that's not because you don't love. It's not because you haven't provided it's because we've just offered some flimsy excuses that really don't matter. So, Father, I pray for those that might be watching us online or here in the building. Help them to come to faith in Jesus Christ today to receive with joy the invitation to know you in a personal way. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.